Thank you guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here among so many talented people and all the speakers. Please give them a hand uh, for everyone who's spoken already. So many pioneers, so many amazing people. Thank you to the Digital Communication Network and World Learning for having us all here and uh, part of Belmont Armenians. Um, so, my talk is The Satire Shield and the Cost of Comedy on the Internet. And, uh, you know, to keep the theme of uh, Bull and Sunshine up uh, our asses here, uh, I'm going to start that out with, uh, with my first slide here, uh, which is literally just uh, Bull and Sunshine on my ass. But I'm going to talk about my relationship to satire. Um, I've written three books. My first book was called The Alphabet of Manliness, and it's a satire of masculinity. It was a New York Times bestseller, kind of um, uh, like A stands for ass kicking, B stands for boners. Uh, I believe it's the only <laughs> New York Times bestseller to have a chapter titled Boners. Uh, my second book is called I Am Better Than Your Kids, where I grade crappy children's drawings. Uh, thank you. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a satire of how we treat children, how we kind of uh, revere their art, uh, where I say the thesis of the book, uh, or the, yeah, essentially the theme or the thesis is, when you tell a kid, good job, it's kind of a dangerous word because it can communicate to the kid that they've done enough, and they usually haven't. And my third book is called Fuck Whales. It's a book full of uh, petty essays and satire about everything from whales to horses to families and poetry. Uh, and my website, as was mentioned, is the best page in the universe. It started in 1997. It's one of the oldest running comedy websites on the internet. It's older than Google and just as successful. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been written about in all these uh, different publications. I mention that only because it's the blown sunshine for us segment of the top. But first, I want to talk about the puffer fish. This is a very dangerous fish, very poisonous. A uh, drop of this fish's toxins is more poisonous, it's up to a thousand times more poisonous than cyanide. Uh, it can kill you instantly. Even holding it can harm you. But people like to eat this fish, and sometimes with deadly results. You have here a Brazilian family that were critically ill, 11 people, after unknowingly eating a poisonous pufferfish for supper. And then in Japan, it's called the fugu, this, uh, this specific fish that they eat. And uh, you can see here the headline says, Blowfish testicles poison seven in Japanese restaurant. Uh, very tragic results. If you want to eat this fish, which I don't recommend it, you know, there's a lot of risk, but you want to find an expert who's really good at preparing this type of fish. Here's one such expert. His name is Chef Ritizo Okamoto. His experience level is expert. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to get poisoned. It just means you're less likely to get poisoned. Because he's an expert. But experts make mistakes sometimes. But the cost of a mistake when you eat a puffer fish is death, right? So if you want to make sushi, how do you start? I recommend you start with something easy, like a cucumber roll. But you can still screw up. You can tear the seaweed. You can cut the cucumber like an idiot, but cucumbers don't have testicles, and you're not going to get poison on them. <laughs> Next, you got your medium fish, right? You got to pick the right cut of fish. You got to slice it properly, and the rice. There's a lot of preparation that goes into the rice. It's not just a clump of rice that someone just squeezed like that. You know, they use vinegar. There's a, there's a whole process. Once you've mastered easy and medium sushi, then you can move up to hard sushi. I found this fancy bullshit in some restaurant in New York. You put the, you know, you got the rice, you got the sushi, you got the cut of the fish, some seaweed salad, and then some roe on top. Looks real fancy, probably very expensive. But once you've mastered easy, medium, hard styles of sushi, then you can maybe consider learning how to do expert sushi. And even then, you're probably going to make a mistake. And that mistake can lead to death. So the cost of making bad sushi is death. What does this have to do with comedy or satire? Uh, we're going to get to that. Because comedy on the internet is similar and there's a cost to doing it badly. All right? So comedy on the internet, you have easy, normal, hard, and then nightmare mode. Okay? It's, it's kind of like a video game selection screen. So easy comedy are your puns. You got your puns and you got your template jokes. Most recently on Twitter, everybody in the world is doing those no one jokes, right? So it says absolutely no one, literally no one has done this or said this and then it has uh, an example of a celebrity who continues to do something that they always do, like J.K. Rowling, she announces someone's gay. Uh, it's a very simple, very easy joke to make. Then you have your medium jokes. Those are memes and captions. Now, memes are generally kind of easy to use because they're also a template form, but making a good meme, especially one that goes viral, is kind of difficult. 
Then you move on to heart. This is your original content and writing. Uh, I don't know if some of you were here earlier from Mike from The Onion, but they, he said that they go over 1,500 headlines and whittle those down to like maybe the top 10. That's really hard. It takes a lot of work, especially if you make good writing or good content. It's really difficult. It takes years of experience. Then you move on to the nightmare mode. Okay? These are your N words and your, uh, your rape jokes and your offensive humor, your so called offensive humor. This is very, very difficult to do. A lot of people try to jump right into nightmare mode without having mastered easy, medium, and hard. As you want to use the N-word in comedy, you can, but the cost of doing it badly is sometimes your career. Uh, you, want to, you want to tell a joke, here's something that's hard to do, make a funny knock-knock joke. That's much harder than using something shocking to get a reaction out of people. A lot of times people like to use racist humor or racist jokes to try to get a shocking reaction out of people, and they say they're being ironically racist. Well, this is what it actually looks like. You have actual racism, you have ironic racism. But to the rest of the world who doesn't know you by your Reddit name or your Twitter handle, this is what it looks like. So they can't tell the difference between ironic humor, excuse me, ironic racism, and literal racism. That's playing comedy on nightmare mode. And a lot of times people try to say that they're just trolling. Uh, for example, there's a Twitch streamer, and they, her name is uh, Paula Gamer, or I should say was, because I believe her account was suspended. Uh, she claimed during the live stream to have killed a dog intentionally while she worked for a veterinarian. Uh, yeah, despite the reaction I'm hearing in the audience, you guys are not taking too kindly to that. Well, neither did the rest of the internet, and she lost everything. She got her account suspended, she had a fairly big following, and then afterwards, of course, she comes out and says, oh guys, I was just trolling. That's not trolling. Uh, trolling, in my opinion, or in my experience, is wasting people's time. I love wasting people's time. Uh, wasting people's time and also getting a reaction out of people who are easily perturbed. Uh, like, for example, a while back, uh, WikiLeaks released an article that said basically the CIA has the ability to snoop on everyone's cell phone and laptops. So I created a, a quick little YouTube video and I said, guys, here's how you can tell if you're susceptible to CIA snooping. First thing you can do is check your address. Go to this website called maps.google.com and type in your address. If it shows up, you're susceptible. And I showed a map of the affected areas. So it was just the globe and it was all red. Next, you can check your cell phone. If it was built after 2003, you're also susceptible to CIA snooping. And finally, if you want to know if your laptop is also susceptible to CIA snooping, go to the manufacturer's website and look at the specifications and look for a feature called Wi-Fi. <laughs> if it has Wi-Fi, you're susceptible to CIA snooping. Now, my favorite thing is to watch people watch this video as the slow realization occurs that I've just wasted their time. That <laughs> makes me so happy. Um, everybody uses the word trolling as an excuse these days, as kind of a just kidding, lol, just trolling, and then it leads into satire. Mark Shkreli, for example, he's a guy who raised the cost of a certain drug by 5,000%. And then he said, after all the heat came down on him, he was finally arrested, <laughs> he says, he was only acting like an awful person as part of a social experiment. No, you weren't. <laughs> you're in jail. <laughs> it's not a social experiment, it's securities fraud. That's why you're in trouble. But he tried to use this as an excuse. Lol, JK, just trolling, satire, etc. It's not. Um, I did a troll right before I came out here on, uh, on Twitter. So in America, uh, it's the gun control issue is a very contentious issue, and a lot of mass shooters use the AR-15 in shootings. So I, uh, and every time this comes up in the news media, people who are for gun control say that the AR-15, the AR stands for assault rifle. It's not true. It stands for Armalite, which is the company that made it. But I just go out every time it happens and say, hey guys, just a reminder, the AR in AR-15 stands for assault rifle. Pisses everyone off. Pisses off the left, pisses off the right, <laughs> because I'm just confusing everyone. Uh, and then someone said, what's the 15 cent for? I said, also a song rifle. <laughs> and you have the realization that I've been trolling you, like this guy. He said, oh no, Maddox, it's a brand name. AR stands for Armalite Rifle. Check the manufacturer, don't pair it lies. Oh. And then 
a few minutes later, of course, trolling. I should have read the comments. It's my favorite. But back to playing comedy on nightmare mode, using racist humor, using racist language. It's possible, but you got to have the experience, and people have to know your intent. For example, South Park. <laughs> this is a scene from a very famous South Park episode. I believe they were Emmy-nominated in this season, I think partly because of this episode. So you have the character Randy Marsh who goes on Jeopardy. The clue is people who annoy you. And there is only two words in the English language that can fit that. And he says the wrong one. The correct word is naggers. Naggers, people who nag you are annoying. So they took this very interesting, they basically created a straw racist. This guy doesn't exist. And then they played with the repercussions of somebody going on national television and saying the worst thing that you could possibly say. It was brilliant satire. It led to so many discussions, not just on the air and off the air, but later, I mean literally right now on stage, what you're listening to. It was fascinating to watch. But they did it, and nobody blinked an eye. Nobody cared, because they knew that their intent, and they pulled it off with a plumb, because they have 20 years of experience. Then you have this shithead. Uh, he's a Dota 2 streamer, and former pro, pro player Sing Sing, who was banned for racist emotes. Now, I read this article, and it just goes on and on. Like He just kept using racist emotes to spell words and you know be clever and cute. And then, of course, like everyone, when they get caught, they say, oh, I was just trolling, or it was satire. It's neither. You're just kind of a shit. If you're a Dota 2 streamer, you're not a satirist. You're not a comedian. That doesn't mean you can't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But you're playing comedy on nightmare mode. And that leads to what happens when you get busted, which is more and more these days, people are using satire as a shield. That leads to this concept, the satire shield. People use satire today as a defense because they know that the general public is too afraid to challenge you on it because not so many people are aware of what satire really is. Satire is using sarcasm or humor to make a point. None of these people are making points. They're just saying something shitty and then getting caught. Oh, hey, I killed the dog intentionally. Ha ha, satire. It's not satire. <laughs> you're not making a point, other than you're an awful person. Um, a while back, probably about six, seven years ago, there was a Facebook campaign where you had to change your profile to, I think, a children's cartoon to help raise awareness against child abuse. And I thought, oh god, here we go. What's this, gonna do? What's this really going to do? Nothing, probably. So I came out and I made a YouTube video. Obviously, I, I, I support that message. Like, we shouldn't abuse children, right? But it's not on brand for me to say that. That's lame. Um, <laughs> So here's how I say it to my audience, because a, a certain segment of my audience is awful people. Um, they're awful, they're idiots, they're morons. So how do I reach these cynics, right? So I said, okay guys, look, if you want to reduce childhood abuse, child abuse, just pledge to abuse one less child every day. <laughs> that is concrete. You're, you're gonna see concrete results if you abuse one less child every day. So that speaks to the cynics, that speaks to the shitheads, that speaks to my audience. <laughs> and that's how you can do, you can use satire, but you have to know what you're doing, you have to know what you're saying, because they, people can very easily get the wrong message, like Secret Hitler. People say, wow, this game's, this game's amazing, uh, for the wrong reasons. You have to know what the person's intent is. If you're an anonymous person on the internet with no body of work, and you go out and try to do the South Park thing, and use some edgy humor and edgy language, well, prepare to pay the cost, and the cost is sometimes you lose everything. These people, these seasoned comedians, Pat Oswalt, Ricky Gervais, all these people, they have years of experience. So you know, at worst, if they say something that isn't funny, it's just that. It's not funny, but it's not something that is intended, they're not intending to cause any harm. They're not intending to attack a minority group or anything like that. At worst, they told a, a shitty joke. They're experts. But again, sometimes experts make mistakes. Anyway, that's my talk. Thank you.